Amen. Or am I am I on? Did I push the buttons right? Can you hear me? Huh? No. No. Am I not on? Does it register I'm on? It's green now. I should be on. Testing one, two, three. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Yeah, I'm a quiet guy. Chris is probably louder than me, so I'll, I'll need all the help I can get. Are we, are we there? Can you hear me now? We still remember that commercial. It's amazing. Which company was it? See there? It, stuff works. I don't know why it works, but I mean, I don't have Verizon, but we kind of remember who it was. It's good to be back. It only took 22 years to... To get back in here, but uh, actually we've been in for other things, but not to actually preach. And uh, Chris was right; we did uh, lead worship, but we also led when we first came here, 22 years ago, when we got ready to start Celebration Church. We hadn't 100% made up our minds. Uh, left the church in Southern Illinois and came up to in-laws to Cheryl's family and thought we'll just worship up here. We're not going to stay down there. So we we lasted one Sunday at First Baptist with them because Ed called that afternoon. <laughs> And said, uh, I, hear, I don't know how he heard this, but he said, I, heard, I hear you're not pastoring right now. Uh, what are you doing? And I told him, I don't know. So uh, he said, well, we're thinking about having a little revival meeting. And wondered if you and Cheryl would come and lead the worship, and then you could preach the revival. And so we did that like the week later, maybe two weeks at the most probably. And they, you didn't have a pastor here, so they decided, said, well, how about just coming for a while and do that every Sunday? So we just had kind of a revival every Sunday for, I don't know, maybe a month, something like that. And in that process is when God confirmed to us that we ought to go to Pena and start the church. And so we started house looking and found a house. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, but we hadn't been back to preach because, I don't know, a few years later, Chris came. And, uh, and you didn't need us anymore. So, uh, <laughs> but we got pretty busy. So we've been busy the last 22 years. But it's great to be back and to be with you and see some familiar faces and, uh, uh, and a few that we don't recognize. But that could be because I don't look the same either. Uh, so it, it could be that you were here with us 22 years ago, but I just don't recognize you and you don't recognize me. But here we are. And uh, as the brother said, leading the music, we are kind of in the Easter season here. It's going to be on us here in a couple of weeks. And so our thoughts are already going in that direction. Technically, we worship, you know, the Lord and resurrection every Sunday. That's why we do it on the first day of the week instead of the, the actual Sabbath. Uh, but at the same time, there's the yearly anniversary, and uh, that's approaching us now. So as we were looking at this day, and I began to think about what uh, the Lord might have us uh, talk about, uh, it, it lends to that, but at the same time, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, our title this morning is Don't Let Anything Steal Your Joy. And I noticed uh, because maybe uh, from sending Chris the info earlier, we, we got uh, some verses that had joy and rejoice in it. And at the very beginning, uh, the, uh, our, uh, the scripture is one of the verses we're going to look at. We're going to look in John chapter 8 for one verse, and then we're going to look at uh, chapter 16 and talk about some joy. So I don't know if I'm causing that fuzzing or, or where we're at on this. I can, yeah. That'd be easier. This one on, check one, two. Yeah, we're good to go. So we're going to go to John, and we're going to look just one verse, which you actually uh, sang just a little bit ago. And then in uh, verse in chapter 16, uh, we will talk about joy and how Jesus talked about it. But joy is a difficult thing to uh, describe and define. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then uh, uh, rather than read in chapter 23 of Luke, I'm just going to talk about that. And you'll recognize the story. Uh, and it's about the crucifixion. But we're going to zoom in of all people on the thief on the cross uh, and describe and talk about joy a little bit. Because we're going to define it and then figure out how to get it and then how to hang on to it. And that's what we want to talk about and not let anybody steal your joy. And you might think, I'm just, I'm not feeling the joy. I don't know that they need to bother stealing it. That probably means they already have. You can steal somebody's joy before they actually get it. You can steal them from, you know, rob their opportunity. Uh, 
The devil's doing that to most of the world right now. He's already stolen the joy that they should have because God has provided it, and the world doesn't have it, so where'd it go? Uh, the devil's stealing it. So it works both ways. So let's look into John chapter 8 first and uh, look at verse 32 simply where Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And you say, Wait a minute, now you've already left joy and you've gone to truth. There is no joy without the truth. That's the point. There's no hope. There's no peace. There's no comfort. There's no purpose. There's no direction. There's no anything until you get the truth. Because lies don't bring any of that stuff. I don't know why that's not obvious to the world, but apparently it's not because out of 7 billion people, at least 6 billion haven't figured it out yet. You can't build anything on a lie. It's going to fall. It's, it, it has to. It's not true. Jesus said you'll find freedom, which would include some joy and peace and all these other things. We'll talk about that in a moment, but when you know the truth and when you've got the truth. Well, then in chapter 16, later on, he's trying to prepare his disciples for what we're preparing for physically here, you know, as the crucifixion and resurrection start coming our way with the annual time. He's trying to prepare them for it, and they just don't get it. Before we read, just to, to prep you with this so you'll see it, they're not understanding. He's going to tell them, you see me, then you're not going to see me because, see, he's going to die, and they won't see him in the grave. And, but then you'll see me again. But 40 days later, he's going to ascend back to heaven, and it's going to be, uh, you're not going to see me again, but someday you're going to see me again. And so they got all confused. So let's look and see what he says in John 16, beginning with verse 16, where he says, A little while, and you will no longer see me. Again in a little while, and you will see me. Therefore, some of his disciples said to one another, What is this he tells us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father, he had already said that before to them. And they said, What is this he's saying? A little while. We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew they wanted to question him, so he said to them, Are you asking one another about what I said? A little while, and you will see me. Not see me again. A little while, and you will see me. I assure you, you will weep and wail, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will rob you of your joy. So Jesus was clearly trying to get them to understand that there will be some sorrowful times, and there will be some times when they don't physically see him, but hang on, because they will again, but then they'll be gone again. He'll be gone again, and we, and we don't see him physically. And we look forward to that time, and yet if I'm reading it right and understanding it right, that really shouldn't have anything to do with real joy. So let's define it first, and it's difficult to define. Um, the best way, I think, is to first of all compare it to happiness, which is not nearly joy, but it gets us started, and then look at some more fullness in that joy. Happiness is a really good feeling that you get because of your circumstances. So you get up in the morning, and the sun's shining, and it's warm outside, and uh, for some of you, the birds are singing. For me, that's an annoyance, but <laughs> my wife... My wife's always been a morning person. She's like, listen to the birds. They're just singing and chirping like crazy. And I said, they're not singing. They're griping. It's morning. It's too early. But most people think that's a nice thing. And so I'm just a little weird. I'm not a real morning person, whether I'm up or not. And, uh, but the, the day starts good, and you have no big problems in your life. So you're feeling good. You're happy. And while you're happy, a front moves in, and the clouds get dark and it drops about 20 degrees in 10 minutes, and it starts to rain, and it's cold out, and it may be cold enough to sleet or snow, and your plans have just gone out the window, and you're not happy anymore. That's happiness, when you felt good because things were going all right, circumstances. Joy includes happiness. It's that same good feeling, but it doesn't matter what's going on. It's deeper than that. And it includes some other things. If you read, if you look up verses about joy and rejoice and joyful in the Bible, you'll see it often tied with other words that we're familiar with, like peace 
and comfort and satisfaction and fulfillment. The Bible tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength, and that's going to give us a clue as to why somebody wants to rob that from you so you'll have no strength to live like God wants you to because we find that in this deep, deep happiness that doesn't matter. That's why the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. If I die, that's gain. So basically he was saying, it doesn't matter which way I go here. I'm a winner. I've accomplished what God wants me to do. I'm living for God, and he's taking care of things. Joy includes all of that. He said, I've learned to be content in every kind of circumstance, good, bad, or indifferent. It didn't matter. It might affect your happiness for the moment. But it doesn't affect that deep down inside peace and comfort and sense of fulfillment and accomplishment, purpose. All, I think all those things are included in joy. If I know who I belong to, and that's the Lord, and that He never leaves me nor forsakes me, and no matter what this life throws at me, He's in charge and all is well. And when this life's over, it's just all good to come. That's a deep happiness you can't mess with unless you let somebody. And so my challenge is don't let anyone steal that from you. But let's make sure you've got it first. And my illustration is from Luke chapter 23, which we won't read, but it's the story of the crucifixion. And you know this story, but let me remind you and zoom in on the thieves there, that after terrible torture, Jesus was taken to the hill outside of town and so were these two thieves and they were all nailed to a cross and, and hung up there to suffer and gradually die basically from suffocation because the, the beatings and the, the whippings and the nailing to a cross causes the body to just sag and cuts off the wind and eventually you can push yourself up a little bit for a while but then you're going to go back down and eventually you're going to suffocate to death, a horrible, terrible death. And all three were facing that. Jesus in the middle and a thief on each side. The crowd down below, some were mournful and sorrowful. Some had deserted Jesus before. His disciples weren't following too well. And, and many were mocking him. And one of the thieves joined in and said, If you're the Messiah, why don't you save yourself? Oh, and us too. But the other thief, the one that we zoom in on, the one that we talk about mostly, the thief on the cross is how he's known. We don't know anything else about him but this. Now, if, if you're a reader, you can find out my blog later. I have created the entire life story of the thief on the cross. I, I just, I've always wondered why he made this statement that he made. How could he have come to this point? Because what he said to that other thief was, don't you even fear God? You and I are up here because we deserve this. This is the just punishment for the kind of life that we've led. But not this man. This man has done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Are you kidding me? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's dying on a cross. What kingdom could he be talking about? We're all going to die here in just a few minutes or an hour or so, and yet he's saying, you're coming into a kingdom, and I want to go with you. Remember me. And Jesus said, I'm telling you for sure, this day you will be with me in paradise. In that moment, that thief got joy, I'm telling you, based on scriptures, based on what it means to get joy and where it comes from. He accepted the truth, and the truth sets you free. And he wasn't caring about dying anymore. He got joy. A blessing he got that we don't get is there was no chance for anybody to steal his joy. He didn't get even a chance to play it out. It's over for him shortly. But he got it. This man who all of his life, his, that joy had been stolen from him. But he got it. And nobody's ever going to steal it again. You will be with me in paradise. We're going to see our brother, the thief, one of these days. And then he'll probably say, you know, that story you wrote <laughs> wasn't even close. But, but, but nonetheless, he got his joy, and he's in heaven today with him. So what happened to give him that deep down assurance, uh, peace, comfort, understanding that says, I'm dying on a cross, and in a sense, I, it's who cares? I'm going to be with this man forever. How did he understand that? 
But that's the first key is if you want nobody to steal your joy or no event to steal your joy, you better make sure you've got the real thing first or it's already been stolen. And Jesus said you got to know the truth for that. That's the first step of hanging on to joy is getting it, and you got to recognize the truth. That's what the devil is so active, and today he's just got a lot of help to hide the truth. Romans chapter 1 talks about they, they have suppressed the truth. They've rejected God by suppressing the truth, and that's our world today. There are so many lies. Uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I know I don't look that old, but I do, and, uh, but I am. And, and, and the 60s was an age of turmoil, but not in the little towns in the Midwest where I grew up in Forsyth. We didn't have the race riots. The Vietnam War was going on, but we didn't riot over it. We were playing in the streets. We were safe. We didn't lock our doors. We left the keys in the ignition of the car because there's nobody going to bother it, and that way you don't have to worry about where they are. <laughs> Just get in the car and turn it on and go. We had a, a great time in the smaller communities, at least, to enjoy life, and church was a big part of that. And even though a lot of people didn't go to church, and I've learned over the years, well, they really weren't true Christians, I, I know now. But growing up in it, there was a respect for the church and, and for the Word of God. Schools never touched any Sundays for anything. Little League ball didn't get played on Wednesday night or practice on Wednesday night, and there wouldn't have been one or two guys on the team who went to church. Nobody went to church on Wednesdays but Baptists, and there weren't very many of us. And yet they would not schedule on Wednesday night because those crazy Baptists go to church. There was a, a covering of the truth, but there wasn't any better understanding. But these days with the Internet and cell phones and 7,000 channels on television and whatever, we've got so much access to so many ideas and so many opinions in an instant that the devil uses all of that to suppress the truth. You will never have joy unless you let the truth set you free and get that joy. But the truth is this. God is real. We're even being taught in our schools now that He's not. There's no such thing as God. Oh, there's such a thing as a rock because it all started with a rock. Where'd the rock come from? We don't care. Oh, we believe in, in the beginning God. Well, where'd God come from? You can't explain that. They can't explain the rock, but that's okay. Because, see, there's no responsibility and accountability with a rock. <laughs> so it exploded and we created a universe somehow and we uh, ended up with evolution and over millions and millions and millions and billions of years. Finally, a couple of monkeys turned into people or something. And then, and, and then all of a sudden, those people began to get really smart. And they began to figure out all kinds of things like morality and, and, and all kinds of answers to questions. And it all came from a rock we can't explain. And we can't explain anything that happened in between times. And that somehow is better. I learned years later that what happened to me at six years old was as simple as I believed the first four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. And when you accept that truth, all the rest of the truth makes sense. If there's a God, then He can create people. If there's a God who can create people, then He can relate to people, and He can explain Himself, and He can inspire a word so we can read the Bible. And yes, it can be a true book because there's a God. It all makes sense. A God can walk on water. A God can cause Peter to walk on water. A God can divide the waters and let the Israelites go across and then shut the waters back up and drown the Egyptians. God can do that stuff. God can raise the dead and heal the sick. Rocks can't do that. People can't do that. The truth is that God is real, and He made us for a relationship. The thief somehow, you say, was he grasping all this? He had to be grasping some of it. If there's no real God... Now, who's that man on the cross in the middle? How's he going to have a kingdom when he dies here in another hour? When he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, this is a Jewish man realizing this is the Messiah. He's heard the stories. You say, how do you know that? Because he's Jewish. They made sure. He grew up knowing the stories. Every Jew everywhere. 
understands Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They drilled it into their children's heads. They didn't have a Bible to read. They didn't have the Internet to mess with. They didn't have phones to deal with. They just simply passed it on and made sure everybody heard it. Now, whether you believed it or not was your choice. And up to this point, the thief hadn't believed it. He probably hoped for it. That's just kind of the condition of the life. You kind of hope somebody's going to save this mess someday. You kind of hope that some of it's true. Everybody wants to go to heaven. They don't even know if there is one. Certainly they don't believe in a God who makes it. Back in the 60s, they had a song that said, I don't believe in heaven, but I pray there is no hell. That's the concept of the world. Don't really want to believe in heaven because that would mean there's a God who made one. I mean, we would have no concept of heaven or hell if it wasn't for a Bible that the world says isn't true. Does that make any sense to anybody, or am I just different than everybody else? Oh, there's no God, but we're all going to heaven someday. Heaven? Where'd that come from? Well, the Bible's not true. Then where'd you get the idea about heaven? From the Bible. From the God who wrote it. From the God who made heaven. Well, surely he'll let me in. You don't believe him, but you don't believe in him doesn't matter <laughs> I mean they're so wacky you can't even keep up with their logic because it's not logic it's not real God is real he made you for a relationship with him and that relationship you need to understand this requires righteousness you are not going to heaven unless you have perfect righteousness oh, yeah that's what I said listen you're not going to heaven without perfect righteousness the bad news is none of us has any the Old Testament says our righteousness is like filthy rags. Do you really think you could go to, when you die, you could show up at heaven and, and they say, uh, why should we let you in? Because I got filthy rags. <laughs> Here, take my filthy rags and let me go into heaven forever. I get tickled at people thinking they could give enough money and buy their way in. And, and we talk about the streets of gold in heaven. You know what that really means to me? We just walk on gold up here. We don't, we don't spend it. What are you going to do, chisel off a chunk of the street and go to the store? Hey, I got some gravel here. I want, you're going to show up to heaven and say, what do you got there? And you got a bag of gold, and they're going to say, that's gravel. That's, that's cement. We make roads out of that stuff. I got a sidewalk in front of my house made out of that stuff, and you think that's going to buy you into heaven? Heaven is so valuable, so great, so way beyond our imagination, we couldn't come up with anything in this world that would get us into heaven. And the Bible has clearly said that you had to have more righteousness than the Pharisees who thought they had it all. They thought they were so righteous, so much better than everybody in the world that surely they would go. And Jesus comes along and says, I'm telling you, unless your righteousness exceeds what they think they've got, you're not getting in. Matthew chapter 5, he said, Be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. None of us are. That would mean none of us get to go to heaven because it takes perfect righteousness to get there. But what happened to the thief when he said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus gave him his own righteousness. That's what happened to me at six years old. When I confessed that I was a sinner and asked Jesus to forgive me for that and come into my life, I got His righteousness. That's what God does. Salvation, you surrender to Jesus Christ. He gives you the Holy Spirit. God adopts you into His family and gives you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So when I show up to heaven one of these days and want in, He's going to say, what do you got? And I'll say, I got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Come on in here. There's a song that Jesus steps up and says, this one's with me. That's, that's how I'm going to get in. I'm in with him. It's his righteousness. And the thief got that. Unfortunately for him, I guess in one sense, is he didn't get to live that out in that relationship. But he has ever since for 2,000 years. And it lasts forever. But he started it with recognize the truth. Somehow. Maybe when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing here. Maybe it kicked in then, and he realized, this guy really is. He's heard the stories. He's had to. Everybody in Jerusalem knew why that man was on that cross. 
That's how he made the statement. He didn't do anything wrong. That's a tremendous statement. Because he could have pointed to any of you and me. He pointed to the other thief. He pointed to himself. He could have pointed to any of the disciples, any of the Romans, Herod, anybody, and said, they did. <laughs> They've done wrong. You've messed up. I've sinned. We're here because we deserve it, but not this man. He's identifying this man. This is the Messiah. I don't know when it clicked, but it clicked for him somewhere. And he realized it is true. The things I've heard, the things I've hoped for all my life, the things every one of us has been hoping for, it's right here. That's a tremendous step of faith because that man's dying. <laughs> that man's dying on a cross. The disciples couldn't figure it out. They don't even understand he's going to be gone for a few days. And the thief on the cross says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I want what it takes, and that's you. So take me with you is what he's saying. So he got his joy. Now, he didn't live, but we have. If you've got that joy, and that's the first step, make sure, recognize who the truth is, and that the Bible is the truth about him, and start going with that. Get that joy in Jesus Christ, but also realize that it's useful. Realize the usefulness of this joy. But really what we're saying is the relationship is useful. It gives us, first of all, a purpose. This thief who had no purpose all of his life but to steal, a life of greed, selfishness, violence, anger probably, taking advantage of people, cheating people out of their joy and their happiness. That's the only purpose he had, and, and it's going to be over in a few minutes. Whatever his purpose was, the purpose of the Roman soldiers, whatever it was, it's going to be over one of these days. The purpose of at least 6 billion people today, this morning, in this world, is going to end when they end because their purpose has been in self, whatever it is. You might be a school teacher, you might be a, a housewife, you might be the boss of your company, or you might be a manager, or you may just work, you might be a student, and you face teachers and principals. None of that is our purpose. It's how we make a living. It's how we impact the world, possibly, and to some extent. But our purpose is to please and honor the Father. We get to do that as husbands and wives and business people and contractors and farmers and doctors and lawyers and factory workers and teachers and all that that's how we make a living that's how we do some good things it's how we can continue to do what we're supposed to do our purpose is to please the father and only in that relationship can you do that? But if you do that, you, you sense that joy. You sense that fulfillment because you're doing what you were created to do. That's where joy comes from. That's why the birds probably really are singing. They're doing bird stuff. They were created to do that stuff. They eat worms and fly around and, you know, drop their calling card on my windshield and all that stuff because <laughs> they're birds. And they're singing in the morning because that's what God created them to do. I think that's what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon in the Mount when he said, look at the flowers. They're more beautiful than Solomon and anything, but why? Because they're just doing what flowers do. They just grow and shine and bloom. And he said, the birds of the air, they don't work. They don't make their own clothes. And yet God watches over them. Why? Because they're doing what birds are supposed to do. That's what he created them to do. If you and I would do what we're created to do, and that is bring honor and glory to the Father, we'll have joy and sing and do what we're supposed to do and just keep it up forever. That's the truth. God made you for him. And when you live that life, you get this joy we're talking about that's hard to describe. In fact, the Bible calls it joy unspeakable and full of glory, a peace that passes understanding. It, basically, what the Bible's telling us is I, God gives us so much, we don't even understand it all, but we get it. So realize its usefulness. Just take it. It gives us our purpose. 
But if you're going to fulfill God's purpose, you're also going to have to have God's principles. You don't get to live any way you want. This bugs me more than anything. We've got a world full of people that even who will be willing to admit that maybe there is a God and maybe there's a heaven and, and maybe the, you know, the Bible's a good book and, and we ought to do good stuff, but then they decide what that is and how to accomplish it. As if God doesn't matter at all. And so they get to define the relationship themselves. Let me tell you something. Is there any place else in the world that works? If a husband defines the relationship totally with his wife, pretty soon he won't have a wife. And vice versa. In a relationship, you've got to understand the relationship and work with it. If children try to tell their parents what the relationship is going to be like, they're going to be problems. If the parents don't understand what their true purpose with raising kids is, there's going to be problems. You can't have a bad relationship with your boss and keep that up very long. <laughs> the relationship's going to change if you don't work within the relationship. You can't buy something at the store that needs guaranteed. Go buy you a new TV. Get online and just join something. And what do you got to read first? The terms and conditions. None of us ever read those. But at the end, you don't get any further unless you click that box that says, I have, we lie, I have read, <laughs> I've read and agreed to all these terms. Most of us don't. If it's real short, I'll read it. But when you get to the bottom of that page and you have to read more and you have to read more, I'm like, yeah, they got me. Click it and go on. Every relationship we've ever been in, I mean, you're born and you got a relationship with parents and you got to do what they say. They're having a relationship and they got to help each other work through this thing. You go to school and you got a relationship of some sort with the other kids and the teachers and you got cousins and every relationship requires that you understand the relationship and work with the terms and conditions of the relationship. Otherwise, we all know we're going to have problems. And yet, the world thinks and often the church thinks we can have this relationship with God and we get to define it. And if God doesn't like it, then who cares? Now, we would never say that out loud, but that's the way it works. I mean, Jesus said you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that gives you this joy that we're talking about. But he also said there's no way you can have that unless you go through him. Well, the world likes to say, oh, there's all kinds of ways to get to heaven, if there is one. There just can't be just one way. Well, Jesus said there is. Oh, but we get to define that ourselves. We get to decide how God lets us into heaven and we are all going to just go our own way and so we're hearing so much that everybody has their own truth that's the biggest joke or the biggest hoax this world has faced that cannot possibly be true <laughs> that everybody gets to have their own truth my truth is that what you own is mine so just give it up bring it on over but your truth is no I've worked for it and it's mine and my family's well, they can't both be true. One of us or both of us is crazy. <laughs> One of us has got to be wrong. And multiply that by 7 billion times. There's no way that could possibly be true, and most of the world lives by it. And God doesn't even factor in until it's time to show up for heaven. And then all of a sudden, God has to understand, but I get in because I was sincere I was sincerely wrong, but I was sincere. Yeah, yeah, but I told you you had to believe in my son. I told you you had to come with one way. Oh, I know, but, uh, you know, I messed that up, so it's okay. I mean, I don't know what the excuses are going to be, but they're not going to work because God has clearly identified himself. He's made himself known. He has revealed himself. He's way above us, but he chose to reveal himself. In many ways, the book of Hebrews says, but in the last days through his own son, he came down and showed up. And they said, show us the Father. And he went, ta-da. I mean, he didn't literally, but he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We are the same. There's, there's no excuse for not knowing enough about God to accept his truth and then put it into practice. And that includes to practice it his way. He's God. Live by his principles. You say, well, how can I do that? Well, that's the third point. You've got to rely on his power. 
This is a spiritual thing. This is not physical. Read Ephesians chapter 6 and you read about the, the putting on the whole armor of God. It's a spiritual battle. We're not talking about getting yourself prepared to do a physical job. It's a spiritual thing. And you're going to have to have spiritual weapons. You're going to have to have a spiritual mindset. You're going to have to have more than you and I have. How am I going to say no to temptation over and over and over when I want to do that? I mean, isn't that why it's a temptation? Because we kind of would want to do it. We kind of like the idea of that. Not supposed to. Oh, there's the temptation. I'm not really tempted to drink alcohol. I've never had a drink, a sip of any kind of alcohol in my life. That's not a credit to me. God just did that. I was tempted a few times when I was a teenager. But once I overcame that, it's just not a temptation. You can put all the alcohol you want out there and I'm just not going to drink it. That's not a temptation for me. Now, put a piece of coconut cream pie out there, and the doctor says, you know what? You shouldn't eat any more sweets. I'm going to be tempted to eat one anyway. Certain things tempt you that don't tempt me, and things tempt me that don't tempt you, but how could I consistently do that? i got to have a power that's beyond me. Because most temptations really are deeper than the actual temptation when the devil tempted jesus and said turn that stone into bread it wasn't about hunger it wasn't about eating bread it wasn't about jesus hadn't eaten in 40 days he needs something to eat it was about take a shortcut to glory if you would do that people will follow you jump down off of the temple he said and the, the angels won't let you get hurt and people will flock to you and follow you but jesus knew no i've got to go to the cross i got to die and pay for their sins or they'll never have a relationship with me. They can't because they don't have the righteousness. And if he had taken a shortcut, every one of us would be lost forever. The devil was trying to steal our joy before we ever even got the opportunity to get it. If he could shortcut Jesus, then he shortcuts us all. These are spiritual problems, and we're going to have to have supernatural problems power that comes from a supernatural provider you're going to have to have god's help when jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free well the truth's right in here it's in the book that tells us about the man who is truth and the thief realized that i wonder if you realized that i wonder if you realized that the one and only god of the universe provides you the power you need to have the kind of joy we're talking about, to have the kind of peace, to have the purpose, to have the, the, the grace, the, the abilities. The Bible says in Peter that he gave us everything we need. It doesn't stop there. He gave us everything we need to live godly lives. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But we can't do that. But God can in us. And he says, God is in us both to will and to do according to his good purpose. You'll need his power, and he's willing to provide it. You've got to have supreme power to do supernatural things, and you need that because it's a spiritual battle. The thief didn't have to do that. He died and went on to heaven. That's just was his, his deal. He didn't have any joy for however old he was. But in his final moments, he got joy because he got a relationship with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. And from that day on, he was one of the family. And he went to be with the Lord forever. If you haven't done that, there's no joy for you. For all of eternity, there'll be no joy for you, no real happiness at all, no peace, no comfort, no purpose, no direction. No legacy, nothing going to be left behind because the only thing that gets left behind is what you do for God and you're not in a relationship with Him. First of all, find that peace. Recognize the truth of the man on the middle. The man on the middle cross. There's the truth. God made you. He made you for Him and He'll help you live that out and that brings real joy. And do not let anyone or anything steal your joy. Don't let the lies of Satan, the lies of the media, the lies of the politicians, the lies of the celebrities, the lies of culture, 
That's all any of that is. It's just a segment of culture. And the culture has totally gone with the devil to say, we all can do whatever we want, and there are no real consequences. And who are you to say differently? Well, I'm nobody, but God is, and he says differently. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is there's no joy apart from Jesus Christ. The thief learned that. Many others have learned that. Many of us have learned that. We don't always live it right. We let him steal a little joy at times because he's messing with us. And we don't go armed for spiritual battle, but we can. It's all there. Start with Jesus and continue with Jesus and you'll end with Jesus and there will be your joy. And don't let anybody take that from you. Would you stand with me for prayer? I'm going to invite Chris to come up front and be here in case someone needs prayed with or some of the other of us can, but uh, don't let anybody steal your joy. Even right now, God may have been speaking to you about even something else. And in your heart, you're thinking, you know, I, I need to talk to the pastor. Or I need to pray, but I don't know what others think of me. Or this is not my church. I just came today. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want people to, to think I'm something. Or That's the devil trying to steal your joy. Because there's joy in submitting to God. There's joy in surrendering. So if you need to pray, you pray. If you need to sing, sing. But whatever God's speaking to you, deal with that. Or somebody's stealing from you. Don't let them. Come to Jesus for whatever need you have. And he'll take care of that. What do we sing?